I think we'll get going there, folks. Um, sorry for that bit of a delay. Um, there is hop in the in the chat box though, which is absolutely great to see. That's a good question, Brian. Um, Ali, um, everyone who probably probably knows me at this stage, if not, then um, it's not really relevant anyway. <laughs> I'm Luke, I'm the W Club manager. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and address Brian's fantastic question in the box there where he says, what is, what's the order for the night so we can get lined up as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ali. I'm the Johnny Walker ambassador. I, I'm based up uh, just outside of Edinburgh, a small town called Linlithgow. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks to Luke for inviting me down and thank you to you guys for um, listening to me uh, chat through five, what I hope are, are very delicious whiskies on a, on a Thursday evening. Um, the order we're gonna do these delicious whiskies in, uh, we're gonna start with the Johnny Walker Blue Label um, and we're gonna use that as a reference point. So if you do have, um, I, hope, I hope five glasses, if you don't, fine but if we can keep the blue label to one side we'll, we'll go back to it during the tasting so blue label first i'm going to move up into the highlands and go to klein leash then we're back down the road to ben rinnis and then we're going to stay in Speyside, move on to craig and Moor, and finally finish up with the johnny walker blue label legendary eight um and i'll explain the reasoning for that hopefully a little bit later in terms of why I've mapped it out like that. But um, that's the order for tonight. Uh, if you don't have five glasses, don't worry. Um, with my work hat on, I'd suggest having water close by as well. But uh, that's up to you guys what you do with that water. Um, yeah, Ali, while, while people are getting poured in there, apologies. Um, sure. It's very disorganized tonight. So it's not my normal way. But I totally forgot to mention that, that we're going to be doing some prizes tonight um, in terms of giving away um whiskey so actually next to me here i have a blue label and i have all the line bottles we're going to be tasting um so we are so if, yeah everyone has a chance to win as we did some of you on the, were on the talisker tasting we did this as well for this so we definitely agreed myself and ali agreed we'd be giving away one for if you want to take a, a picture um this is obviously totally optional but this is your chance to win a win a, a lovely bottle of whiskey um to snap a picture of your your tasting setup and tag us in any social media that we're on which is uh, instagram twitter or um facebook um and you can win one of the bottles and then we'll also be uh, a bottle going for the the best most interesting question on the night regarding these brands we do want you to kind of engage in the chat um and uh one for the best tasting note we had when we did this for talisker we had some absolutely stunning tasting notes um so we do want to to hear as many as possible and yeah then there will be more um bottles going in in addition to that we've got a couple of extras because there's five in the lineup but we'll decide as the night goes on how we'll give away, give those away. Um, so yeah, something, an extra exciting bonus. Nice. I like it. I'm, I'm keen to hear the tasting notes because um, there are always things that I like to steal for when I'm doing this later, later in the year. Um, you guys always come up with the best tasting notes. Mine just um, are the same every time and get a bit boring. So it's nice to hear from you guys what you think. Um, we're we going to give it a few more minutes to get people. No, I think I think we're five minutes in. I think we'll we'll uh, let's give everyone fair enough time to go. So we'll 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 crack on with the blue label. Um, so cool, awesome. Um, thanks, Luke. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start on the blue label. Just a quick bit of history about me. I used to run bars um, and restaurants down in London uh, for quite some time. I moved up to Edinburgh. I've been with Diageo for five years, but I moved up to Edinburgh two years ago where we opened our Johnny Walker Princess Street Whiskey Emporium, I guess is the best word for it, but which is um, eight floors of uh, whiskey kind of experiential immersion. Um, so there's a bonded warehouse under the building. There's a flavor journey where you go on a tour and try three different whiskey cocktails. You can blend your own whiskey there. There's bottle your own whiskey. There's two rooftop bars with unrivaled views of Edinburgh. So if, you, if you're next in Edinburgh, um, please reach out um, to myself and we'll love to host you at um, Johnny Walker Princess Street. Um, eight floors of heaven indeed, that is it. Um, so welcome guys. The, the reason I've chosen to start with the blue label um, is that if we look at the next three single malts, which will be your Klein Leash, Ben Rinnis and Craig and Moore respectively, almost a bit of insight into the, the malts that make up Johnny Walker Blue Label. Um, Klein Leash and Ben Rinnis certainly play a big part in this blend, and as do 
uh, some grain whiskies from Cameron Bridge and Canvas, which is, um, as some of you may well know on the call now, is a, is a closed distillery, um, a closed grain distillery, distillery, which will never make whiskey again. Um, it's now home to um, a lot of our, our stocks in a, in a site called Black Grange, which ha houses well over um, 5 million casks of whiskey. Um, it's a monster of a site, but it's certainly where we keep most of our stock. Um, I don't know many people that are allowed in to have a poke around. It's a very military-esque um, <laughs> guarded site, but it certainly gives us an unrivaled level of flavour and casks to choose from when we're blending Johnny Walker. We, we, we have over 10 million casks of whiskey out of the 20, 22 million casks aging right now in Scotland. So a, a huge library of flavour to play with. And the blending team will always use that word. They blend flavour, not whiskey. Um, they're always looking for unique flavours. Blends will change in terms of their um, build-up, uh, but it's that's the unique job and that's the craftsmanship. So we're experiencing some excellent liquids that have been put together by a crack team led by Dr. Emma Walker, who at the start of this year became our, our uh, new master blender, taking over from Jim Beveridge, who had spent 40 years in the whiskey industry. So quite the legacy. There's been more people sat on the throne of England than there have uh, master blenders of Johnny Walker in that 200 year time period. So a prestigious job um, without a doubt. So take your blue label, uh, raise it up because it's nice to see all your faces with that uh, whiskey in, in, the, in the shot. Lovely, thank you very much. <laughs> Slan uh, have a smell. I always expect Blue Label to be a lot heavier and a lot richer. Um, it's actually quite a light, delicate whiskey. And if you want to have a sip, um, try and keep a bit of that on your palate um, for a few seconds. But as, as your palate gets used to that, we talk about three waves of flavor with Johnny Walker Blue Label. It starts off quite crisp, fresh, fresh cut apple, fresh cut grass. Once that alcohol dissipates, it kind of moves into this wonderful biscuity note. A little bit of chocolate starts to come through, cherry, and then finally, once you've swallowed the whiskey and you start to breathe in, you get a lovely whisper of smoke at the end. Nothing too aggressive compared to the black label, but it's certainly this light, delicate kind of mix of cigar box smoke and, and sandalwood. I get this kind of light, delicate uh, bitterness coming through at the end, but a lovely, sweet, rounded whiskey. We suggest normally serving it with ice cold water on the side and going back and forth in between the two, but it's a, it's a whiskey really to take your time with. Um, it was launched in the 90s in America, and we slapped a $200 price tag on the bottle, and people went crazy for it. People wanted to know what a $200 blend tastes like, why it was $200, I must buy this bottle. Um, and it, it kind of kick-started this, this culture of premium blends and really looking at the craftsmanship that it takes to make a blend like this and make whiskey very approachable. I think for a price like that, there's always the argument to say, well, why don't I just buy a $200 bottle of single malt? But it's, it's actually how these things are made. And when we really boil it down, um, you know, all these single malts have an element of blending in them anyway. So it's nice to look at this whiskey and kind of appreciate everything about it in terms of the liquids going in there. Kleinleash, Ben Rinnis, Cardu, Canvas, um, Car uh, Cameron Bridge. And, and a couple of others, which may change year on year out. But um, the smoke will certainly be coming from Kalila. Uh, most of our smoky um, elements in Johnny Walker, and you'll notice it across the whole range, are all have that whisper of smoke, that kind of signature sign off, whether it's red label, black, gold, green, blue, 18, they all have that element of smoke. So stick some tasting notes in with for the blue label if you wish. Um, but for me, it's definitely those three waves of flavor fresh apple, moving into like almost a, a shortbread biscuity note, a little bit sweeter than that big chocolate hit, and then that lovely little bit of smoke at the end. It's like almost that. got um, almost a Turkish delight on the nose. I don't know what it is. I can't quite place it. Well, you know, there's something I hate, floral I, and sweet there. That really annoys me that you've said that because the, the blending team will tell you that they get a lot of rose from here, rose petal <laughs> almost, and... Uh, every time I think of rose, I just think of Turkish delight and I can't stand the stuff. So I, I try to block it out in my mind that this has any form of, of rose flavouring. But so you're not a fan of Turkish delight, no? I'm not. I'm really not. Because <laughs> every time I, th I think of rose, I think of Titanic. But that's a different story. <laughs> but um, the, 
Is no, it? it's it's extraordinary. And for those of you who, who there was a few people jumped in after I said at the start, we'll be giving away uh, one of the bottles on the lineup to the best um, the best tasting notes. So so please do get them in. Um, Jeff here has either described me, my mid twenties, or the whiskey when he says smooth with a lot with a lot going on. Um, Martin and Lorraine said, "Who remembers Caramac? Uh, I get that on the palace. I'm at a uh, palace. I'm actually not sure about that one. Do you know that one, Ellie?" Yeah, I think so. I know what I know what you mean. Yeah, it's definitely got that. There's definitely that classic caramel honey bouncing through. But I think for me, it's that it's that kind of soft spice at the beginning, moving into all that sweetness, which is quite quite nice. It doesn't start off rich, bold, straight in there like the black label. Um, and Brian says sweet uh, honey arrival, a little uh, smoke and uh, salinity, see uh, stewed orchard fruits. Uh, sorry, the heat has really got to me today. <laughs> a little vanilla custard, some fresh cut grass and gentle peppery spice. Nice. Um, Scott's has great combination of Speyside and Isla. The smoky uh, hint uh, seals the deal. Uh, rotting apples on the nose, but in a good way. Um, hey, look, rot, 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 one man's rotting apples is another man's cider. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, very good. Pastry, pastries as well, I think, is, is spot on. But the smoky finish, it's, I think that's... As long as you guys are all picking that up, that's quite an integral part for us. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about what the Johnny Walker team were really, when they set out this journey 200 years ago, what they were really aiming for. And that smokiness within Johnny Walker is something that's integral to our blends and, and something mm -hmm. that helps it stand out um, across the board. So, yeah, as long as everyone's getting that little bit of smoke, it's certainly not as prevalent as our red label or black. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely there. Um, do you want to move on to the next one? Um, I mean, there's a few, still a few comments coming in. And before we did move on, I did want to, to, to know, because obviously a few people have said uh, about the Johnny Walker experience and that, and you touched on it. But mm. obviously, you mentioned the launch of this in the in the 90s. And then obviously, the, the Johnny Walker experience was only last year. Was it last summer? Was it opened? or um, uh, when, uh, October last. So this has been our first summer. So at the end yeah, of the so, uh, yeah, end of, end of the summer last year or October last year. I mean, it's a big move, move, moment kind of giving the, the brand a home because, I mean, I've always been aware of Johnny Walker, I suppose, in the, in the industry. Um, but obviously, I'm from an Irish whiskey background and you wouldn't really see it too often in shelves in Ireland. But obviously, it's, it's the biggest blend in the world internationally, I suppose. But even, even domestically, you don't see it as much as you, you think you would. So it does, is that, um, that kind of opening in, in Edinburgh, open the Johnny Walker experience, is, is, it, is it about bringing it home as, well, as much as anything or is that a cliched thing to ask? Um, I, th I think, I mean, the, the way they expanded and the countries that we're now sold in, you know, it's this huge entity now in terms of a brand. And I know for a fact we've done case studies where 40% of, you know, people questioned would, would say Johnny Walker's an American brand. And I think that's due partly to its success and its kind of global dominance in the world of whiskey. But to give it a brand home now, I, I you know, I talked to friends who work for the likes of Glenn Fiddick, you know, William Grant, um, Shivers, everyone's been quite complimentary in the, in the fact that we're really bringing scotch into the capital of Edinburgh for people to experience in any way they want. And, uh, and our jobs as ambassadors, you know, all of these guys will say it, is to, is to get people inspired around whiskey, the flavours in it, and, and, and why they should be enjoying this, this spirit that's, you know, made, made in Scotland and, and, you know, talked about all over the world. It's, it's such a unique product. And I think the fact that we can open something like that and invest in kind of Scottish tourism and whiskey tourism, it, it gives people the chance to experience Scotch whiskey however they want. Because my, my biggest fear is always that people who are new to the category are always given whiskies by someone who knows it really well and thrust into their hand is this castor and, you know, peated whiskey. And they're like, fuck me, is that what all this stuff tastes like? And, you know, they're just hairs blown back and they're like, never again. You know, there's, there's still that common misconception that, or whiskey is peated and you know x y and z but it's nice to kind of bust a few myths at that building and, and get whiskey into some cocktails and get people exploring drams by by the flavor profile they like they like you know it's it's like watching frank at, at pot still you know he, he never asks what whiskey you want it's always what do you like eating what do you like drinking you know mm. let me get to know you and then i'll pick you out a perfect whiskey and i rarely see him wrong um not that i'd ever tell him he was if he was but yeah, that's it. I think it's uh, it's it's all about moving the conversation away from scotch and whiskey and talking about flavour, and and that's what we're doing. 
quite well at no, that. That's a, that's that's an excellent question. question. Yeah, no, but spot on. Uh, Brian has, has just clarified it. We're, we're keeping some back. And yeah, Brian, the idea is either in the little glass bottle or in your, if, if in, a, in a glass itself, you have some to compare, we'll keep some to compare with the legendary age, which, which will be the last one we'll taste. Um, Jeff says taste more, tastes like more than 40%, but I, I, I can assure you it's not, uh, Jeff, or unless they're, they're lying to us in the bottle here. Um, Andrew says you'll not get a bottle of Blue Label for 5p, which is going back to the Carmack Bar comment. Um, we got a comment there. How much uh, Kalila is in Blue Label? Is there any official percentage, or is it all kind of hush hush top secret? Um, so uh, that's it's a really it's a very good question. Um, the the easiest way I would explain it, I mean, the, the percentages of of anything, whether you're cooking, whether you're making whiskey, there's a, there's always these variables, and I, I think that's again we, where we need to consider the skill of the blender. You know, the whiskey is it's a it's a living product. It's liquid in wood. It's changing every day, and I think that to to just say oh we would add five percent Kalila and that would be it done. You know, it, it would take away from the skill of what these guys do. We batch normally around six hundred casks at a time. Um, those casks are left in that liquid is then left in stainless steel to marry and the flavors to marry. Um, I would, one thing I've learned since working with the blenders is a little bit of smoke goes a very long way. So I would suggest maybe if we were to put a percentage on it, which please don't take this as gospel because it's definitely not, um, I would say anywhere between five to 2% of that blend would be Kalila. If you want to make a whiskey more smoky in a blend, the blenders have always told me to add more grain. The grain quells the the, the flavors of the other single malts and the smoke is always the last thing to disappear. So if the single malts are drowning out the, the element of smoke you want, the grain will slowly draw those back in. And it's quite a, it's quite a clever tactic um, just to help that smoke shine out. Um, but yeah, I, I would say little. Um, and if we're looking at it from a business perspective, obviously making peated whiskey is a lot more expensive than, than any other style. So yeah, there's very little but I can't put a percentage on it because it will change, you know, every batch, every time they, they take it around. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose that ties in with Phil's question there about how has the blend evolved in terms of flavor profile? I suppose as you say, it's a, it's a living thing and it, 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 it is yeah. going to naturally change over time. Have you, have you ever compared an earlier release with a, with a more modern one? I have, and we, we get this question all the time in terms of, you know, we get a lot of people asking about, um, black label in particular because it's it's one of the longest standing um, labels we have but people that have tried it from 1920 all the way up to the the present day you know the, the whiskey's always changed they there's a very similar flavor profile across all of them but whiskey's change you know if we, if we if we're going back that far distilleries the amount of distilleries that we would have used that closed in the 80s um, prohibition world wars you know the, the, all this stuff really affected um how we how we got to blend and, and what we got to use but um i know when blue label was first released it was it was said to contain port ellen i know that definitely doesn't happen now in in, in this blend that we know and we, we kind of got a backlash on that from you know whiskey lovers saying how can you call this the same blend and that's where the that leads into the question of flavor and how we're talking about blending flavor i know right now and I, and I can't delve into it but I know right now we're having certain distilleries not producing a fruity enough malt for us to use in some of our blends so we're relying on other distilleries and, and the control we have over a lot of these distilleries in terms of changing their fermentation times or where we cut where we're taking distillates off the, the guys at the blending team have such a knack of you know organizing stock for years down the line because you know we have to we, Johnny Walker's 12 years old Johnny Walker Black we have to make sure that those stocks are there because if anything is a hiccup on the way, then, you know, flat label stumbles, the whole brand really takes a, a huge knock. But yeah, it's, it's about balancing the flavor. And if we can take certain Kalilas and they can perform as well as Port Ellen's in the blend, then it's all about, it's all about that balance. Um, mm -hmm. like cooking, cooking your favorite dish with different ingredients um, from all over the world. Each one's going to taste different. Um, in, in its individual form but at the end you should end up with the with the meal that you really want um, or the whiskey uh, that you really want no that makes sense i suppose that ties in with the other question from phil there was saying the, the the blend is universal across market doesn't it doesn't vary in, in in certain markets does it no 
No, everything everything is uh, is obviously to be Scotch whiskey. Everything is aged in in the borders of Scotland. Um, it's blended here, and then it's and then it's exported. Um, but the the volume, I think, once the volume, you realise the actual volume of what we're sending out and how we're batching it. The, the, the not the margin for error is widened, but it certainly gives them a lot more wiggle room to to kind of. Um, change the blends as they as they need to be changed you know we're, we're exporting six bottles a second at the moment you know it's it's 19 million cases a year of johnny walker across 182 countries so there are obviously going to be some differences there's coloring added to the to ensure consistency in terms of look uh and the way the liquid looks in the glass but as for the as for the blend itself it's it's all made here and it's all it's all shipped out um bottled maybe in other in other parts of the world but so a, a bottle every six seconds, as you say, that's quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, so um, Nineteen million cases, or a, bo a bottle every six seconds, is, and that's export. That's not what's sold. That's exported all around the world. So, and is that mostly black and red? Is it? Ma the majority of it, yeah. I know. I know. I've been sat in some very remote parts of the world, and it's either red label Gordons or Smirnoff. So yeah, the, the reach seems to be quite far, but red label definitely uh, is always one that seems to be there, and then whatever the local market. Um, is but that's the spectacular story of it all. I think the fact that you know it's this recognised brand and it's it's something that people really get behind in culture and you know it's part of their day to day lives or and rituals. Um, it's quite amazing. And if anyone hasn't seen the documentary, um, the man who walks the world is the Johnny Walker documentary that was put together by a director called Anthony Wong. Um, and it's it's quite spectacular to see how it fits into different cultures and where it's been utilized. It's it's quite an amazing documentary. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one branch of the family had such success making crisps as well. It's amazing. Um, so, <laughs> so the last question before we come on to the to the Klein leash will be um, why the color blue? What is the meaning behind the colors? That's a good question. That's um, that's one I always get asked. Um, red and black. Uh, I've got red back there, but. Um, they were the colours of the first two labels. When we first started selling Johnny Walker, we had a white label, a red label, and a black label. Um, the white label was dropped. There's a there's a old story going around that John Dewar's uh, Dewar's whiskey, who do white label whiskey still to this day, and John Walker had an agreement that only that Johnny Walker would drop the white label and Dewar's would do it. But I mean that that conversation never happened. We we dropped it because John Walker, Alexander Walker were really if they if they were making money selling more expensive whiskey there was no need for them to make a, a cheaper version of what they were selling so well anyway so the white label was dropped red label was known as very very old highland whiskey and black label extra special old highland whiskey and which are quite a mouthful to order um in the shop so the colors of the labels became regular part of people's ordering process and that's how the colors stuck with blue there's no definite story behind it i think it's more this kind of blue ribbon, royal blue color that's, uh, you know, associated with maybe something a little bit more premium. Um, gold label is certainly to do with our 100 year anniversary, um, even though it's launched 175 years afterwards. Uh, and green label, again, I'm not I'm not too sure on the on the blended malt and why it's green. I'd like to say it's all about the Scottish land and the, the green, the green pastures, but uh, that's me just making up stories. <laughs> Um, Brilliant. Yeah, red, and, red and the black definitely from people ordering and then we've always just stuck a, a colour to the labels it just seemed to work Marvellous and the platinum has been discontinued I believe um, the, the, the label has I think marketing found it a bit pretentious um, and it's now the 18 year which it's the same liquid um, there's been a few tweaks here and there but it's an 18 year old blend um, for those of you that will know when Gold Label or Gold Reserve was first launched, that was our 18-year-old whiskey. And now we just have Johnny Walker 18. And I think that's really aiming at the single malt drinkers. You know, people sometimes people will pick whiskeys by number uh, to ensure quality in some way. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on the call would poo-poo uh, that idea, but um, I don't have any here. But yeah, the Johnny Walker 18, a blend of predominantly space side malts aimed at the kind of the, the single malt drinker. Um, it's a delicious, easygoing blend, um, but really celebrates space life. Marvellous. So speaking of, uh, of, of, a, of a age statement, have we come on to the Klein Leash, though? So? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So 
Clyde Leash, um, one of these whiskies that's got a, a real cult following. Um, the Johnny Walker Gold 18 is fantastic. Yeah, Jeff, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It is one of my favorite blends. It's a shame that one disappeared. But onto the Klein Leash, um, one of my favorite whiskies uh, out there. I think pound for pound, for me, probably the best Scotch whiskey on the planet. Um, a, because I love the flavor, but B, because of the price point. It's got a 14 year old age statement on it, but it offers all this wonderful complexity. It's a whiskey that really has a hell of a lot going on. Um, so as you travel up the east coast of Scotland, through Dornoch, um, past the Thompson Brothers uh, and their wonderful little distillery, you'll come to a town called Brora and there sits Klein Leash. Um, it's a distillery that dates back to the late 60s, 67. And there's been two distilleries that were a stone's throw apart. One was Klein Leash and one was Brora. Um, and one offered a lot of Isla, um, Isla style malts for Johnny Walker blends, um, which was then sadly closed in 1983, along with a lot of other distilleries around Scotland. It was a sad time for whiskey. Um, and that distillery is now still, it's just reopened, um, is now producing whiskey again, but that is Brora. Um, and we know for a fact that Brora whiskies will fetch 2000 to 10,000 pounds a bottle um, and beyond. But the Klein Leash is a great example of two things, complexity and this wonderful waxiness, this oiliness. If you look at blends um, back in the 60s, this kind of oily characteristic was quite common. And it was something that the drinkers of blended whiskies or the makers of blended whiskies really aimed for. That's kind of changed into a sweeter, more rounded palette um, with a bit more smoke. But this is the Klein Leash, have a smell. Nice and fresh and vibrant, orangey. Yeah, it's got a lot of that kind of fresh zestiness. I get quite a lot of grapefruit peel on the nose as well. Um, and still that kind of heather honey, that kind of lighter lighter style of honey coming through as well. Have a sip and it will do the same thing, but reverse on the, on the palate. It starts off nice and sweet. And then as you're swallowing it, you notice the viscosity and the oiliness, but the way it kind of starts to make the both sides of your tongue tingle once you've swallowed it, that waxiness and that tropical citrus notes, it's almost like a unripe nectarine, how it just cuts off so dry at the end. And it, there's a little bit of spice coming through, almost fizzy, that's spot on. Yeah, Paul, mm. definitely lemon sherbet, um, absolutely. But it's, yeah, it's got that real kind of, almost those lemon sweets, um, the little, sour ones um but the the idea that that whiskey is the i, I guess the only real release from from klein leash is it, it's, it's its staple um we did the distillers edition as well um and a few others that we've launched for special occasions across the years but it's such a fantastic whiskey and i think there's so much going on there to kind of dissect um the waxiness, I'll touch on that quickly. It's not necessarily a flavor, but it's definitely that oily characteristic, that mouth coating viscosity it has. That comes from um, the, what's left over in the faints receiver. So there's always residual oils that are, are left behind when we're making Scotch whiskey. Um, when they were cleaning Klein Leash during silent seasons, they were noticing the waxiness was disappearing. So that, for want of a better word, gunk, is collected and re-added into the distillation process, um, which is completely fine because it's part of the process anyway. Um, but that's what gives Klein Leach that unique waxiness, um, that, that, that mouth feel, which I, I just absolutely love. And I think for the price point and for a 14 year old whiskey, I think it's an absolute belter. It's got a real cult following. There's been books written on, on the Brora distillery and the Klein Leach distillery. It's got a checkered history. Um, but it's, it's one of these whiskies that is, is just, people love it. It's definitely a bartender favorite as well. Um, so, yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, oh, it, that peppery spice is really, is, really, is really good. We've got some great tasting notes coming in there, great comments. So just before we move on to those, I, know, I just want to see the Kevin Wright's comment about the, his whiskey journey started with Red Label over 50 years ago and always keep, keeps a bottle in, in, in his cupboard. That's a fantastic um, <laughs> point. Just want to acknowledge it before we move on. Um, Grimm says, first taste of Klein Leash, lovely. Any spare old odd barrels I can buy for 16 million when I win the lottery? 
Um, Jeff says, have visited Klein Leash a few years ago. The Klein Leash is quite a sharpness in the taste compared to the blue. Um, it's like huffing a custard Danish. <laughs> there you go. Um, Phil says his wife only likes blue label. That almost fizzy comment from Paul, you, you mentioned that one. That's a great um, tasting note. Phil says orange, vanilla, mixed fruit in a leathered bag. Um, interesting. Waxy apples, heather honey, citrus and peppery with a great depth that makes it so popular with all the blenders. Uh, really lo uh, lovely lingering finish. Citrus uh, left with a touch of pepper. Very, very evocative of heather, heather covered mountainside after some rain. That's an interesting, that could be a contender, Kevin, for the um, for the comment of the night. Um, Ian says, uh, gets apples and honey from this. Uh, lemony, heather, lavender on the finish. Uh, yeah. Klein Leash is a fizzy orange peel with the most delicious sharp taste after a new favorite single malt. Uh, love the wild cat of Klein Leash uh, and the whiskey is top notch. Um, explain to us about the, the wild cat there, Ali. Um, the Wildcat's just the it's just the logo. I, I believe it's the logo for Brora anyway. And I, I know when they opened the distillery and named it Brora, they had a few complications about naming a business after the town it was based in. I don't know whether there was old laws in Scotland that were kind of trying to get them to change it. For a while, it was known as Old Klein Leash, but it's it's where we still find the Wildcats of Scotland. The, the very few, unfortunately, that are left are normally roaming the Highlands um, anyway. So. Yeah, it's it's become the Klein Leash um, logo, and if you if you visit the distillery now, it's it's one of the four corner um, malts we talk about with Johnny Walker. So it's the Highland home of Johnny Walker, and if you visit the distillery now, wonderful bar with a, a lovely terrace to look out over the North Sea, and you'll notice a little gold statue of a wildcat in the in the in the small garden in front of the distillery. Um, but the reason I chose that next, and, and someone pointed it out and said, I think apples and, and honey, that's where that initial dry note we're getting in the Johnny Walker blue label is coming from. So that Klein Leash is offering that, that waxiness. For those of you that are saying it's quite fizzy and lemony, the extra 6% we're now at, so we're at 46% ABV, that extra alcohol kick is definitely going to give a little bit more dry, uh, lemony, zesty notes, but it's definitely all the process with, with Klein Leash. And... I think unusually, but um, not in any way, just for Klein Leash, the, the spirit stills are larger than the wash stills. So it's again, providing quite a, um, a robust uh, new make spirit, um, fairly long fermentation times as well. So it's, it's still got that fruitiness to it, but it's, it's something that, it, as someone said before, blenders absolutely love. The finished product is something that's picked up by all the um, all the kind of um, uh, blenders, Compass Box in particular, I know love uh, love it. Um, but even the um, what's the word? Independence. The indie, the indie bottlers as well. I've seen. I've tried some amazing Klein leashes of late. Um, but it's my go-to. If the, if that name's on the bottle, then I'd love to try what anyone's doing with it. I think it's absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> No, really good. Jeff says this must have a big impact on the blue label blend. Uh, he would not need a high percentage um, in terms of having the flavor come through after a small amount being out of there, presumably means. Um, the, there was another comment there about uh, it's quite interesting to go back to the blue label and try and find the Klein niche in it. Um, so people are definitely getting that, that, that connection, which is, which is fantastic. I think, I think that's nice. I, I would go back to it. Um, what I want to do in particular is after we've done the, when we do the next um, single malt, it's just once we've nosed that first, go back straight away after that and nose the blue label and just have a look at how how much that's changed from your first impression of it. And I think it's a really useful thing to do when you do tastings like this. Um, having a lighter style whiskey, especially something that contains grain, it's always nice to go back and smell it again. And it opens up all these different complexities. Um, so yeah, once we do, once we have a smell of the Ben Rinis, go back and smell the blue label and it's amazing the difference uh, it makes to it. No, excellent. And Jonathan has said, I heard Compass Box say, if in doubt, at Klein Leash. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a great couple, uh, comment. Uh, we got like, another taste in there for maple syrup, waffle, and smoky bacon on the blue after drinking the Klein Leash. So again, it's, it's you know, one whiskey influence in the other. Um, Alex, really? a good question there. We might come to that at the end of the tasting rather than right now. You were going to say, sorry, Ali? No, I was just going to say, um, so that there's, there's no... There's no peated malt, um, as far as I know, going into Klein Leash, but that 
that kind of salty saltiness at the end that kind of briny notes almost and that citrusy note can sometimes be very much conceived as being being smoky it's almost mm -hmm. like a, a rock pool or it's it's got that like seasidey note to it um but yeah the, i don't I, as far as i know there's no there's no peated mm -hmm. definitely i can get, get that that brininess yeah, um it's yeah it's sorry no 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 i didn't say anything um yeah that brininess and and that's that black pepper kind of pepperiness can can kind of almost come across as spicy um on the end um definitely um it'd be interesting to see if anyone's got any more comments on the client leash before we come on to the to the ben Rennes. but we might if you if you think um ali we might get get a, a sample of that poured i know i don't want to rush too fast but um no, no. you got it but it, i don't know what you think um uh yeah i mean if i'm um, if there's any more questions on client leash then I'm, I'm happy to answer them but the um what was the question you wanted to do at the end or is it definitely one for the end yeah i mean you know, we could see we could see um uh, it's it's a really good question it's just uh, just i was thinking of, of the running order but alex has said interested to know what's your go-to non diageo brand um ah yeah that's <laughs> that's fine um i get i I think in terms of in terms of whiskey, I absolutely love what Compass Box do. And when John Glazer, I mean, he used to work for the Johnny Walker blending team, um, and he actually pitched the whole idea of of Compass Box to Johnny Walker and said, "How do you how do you feel about making whiskey like this?" And you know, they said, "No, not really us." And he's gone on to do something fantastic. I think I think Compass Box whiskeys are absolutely incredible. Um, outside of that, in terms of single malts, I think. I mean, I know they're, they're the biggest, but I, I love what Glenfiddich do. I, th I think some of their experimental series have been amazing. Um, but I, I just love their core range. I think it's hard to beat um, whiskey like that. Um, and ones that I've tried of late, maybe from the West Coast. Uh, I don't know. The, some amazing Boona Harbins of late. I, I'm a, I frequently pop into Scotch and annoy the guys at the Balmoral um, and they pull out some delicious whiskies. But yeah, I've tried some uh, some amazing Boona Harbins recently as well. So those would be my go-to outside of outside of Diageo whiskies. Well, that's an excellent answer and worth the digression because we've got some great comments in there. Um, so why choose Brora over Klein Leash? Why close Brora over Klein Leash? Was it the age of the distillery, the equipment, or, or was there any other factors, do you know? Um, it was main, mainly because they were producing a, a peated malt for Johnny Walker. Um, Kalila was closed for a short while, and that's obviously where most of the pe peated whiskey would come from for that blend. So, I mean, it's kind of like a, it's, it's quite a melancholic way we view blended whiskey, um, you know, through this melancholic lens that the, these wonderful distilleries are working so hard to produce this amazing liquid, and then we're just mixing it into a blend and off it goes. But when they didn't need the distillery, um, it was it was shut down in '83 because Kalila was back open and fully functioning, and we just we didn't need the whiskey. It was it was a it's a relatively small distillery in the grand scheme of things, so it, it just became an added on expense, I guess. Um, and then you know you slowly realise that the whiskey's aging there and everything else is 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 something quite remarkable, and and they're selling for you know such great money now and a, a really kind of coveted and, and sought after but I um yeah it's it's a shame but it is reopened now um it's quite pricey in terms of visiting I think once you've paid the price to visit uh you'll make that back in the liquids you'll try on the day but um it's nice to see this these places reopening so Port Ellen will be our next big venture in reopening that distillery but Brewer is now making new make spirit and is, is setting casks down so be interesting to see what they start to release. I imagine most of it will be in the early stages, maybe blended with older older brewers. But yeah, when, when they do an actual fish, official release, I, I, I have no idea, unfortunately. And it was closed, it was the early 80s it closed, wasn't it? Um, which, 83. Yeah. 83, yeah, which is when, which is bang when a lot of the distilleries were closing, economic recession and, um, you know, they're the oil crisis and there's a lot of, uh, there's a shift in the in in the market between sort of big brands sourcing blends in the, in the style that Johnny Walker do was obviously that was the way most Scotch was back in the day, um, and things shifted more towards brands going straight to market. So, you know, they, they, I suppose there was a lot of distilleries that were that that fell to the wayside that 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 
at that time. Um, uh, yeah, perfect. Um, there's some great, Jonathan says, back in the 80s, single malts weren't often sold. Whiskey crashed in the 70s, so if it wasn't needed in the blend, the story was closed, which is which is a more articulate expansion on, on what I just said there. Um, and really, we come on to the Ben Rinnis now. So is it Ben Rinnis? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Ben Rinnis, 15-year-old uh, uh, single malt whiskey, um, part of our flora and fauna range, um, which was, I, I guess, it's, it's a real shame that we don't do more with it. Um, it's a, it's basically every distillery that if you if you don't know the Diageo portfolio, it's every distillery that you may not have heard of. It's the ones that we don't really, really shout about it, uh, shout about too much. So the likes of Linkwood, Manicmore, Tiernanick, Strathmill, Glen Spey, Glen Elgin, Ben Rinnis, all fit into the this um, set of releases called Flora and Fauna, and it was really to celebrate um, the the area of the distillery and what it has to offer. Um, and also, I think quite romantically, offer the, the guys that were working at these distilleries a chance to actually try their liquid because there were no real expressions coming straight out of the distilleries. There was a few very limited releases for the special releases that we've done over the last 12 years. Um, I think the Ben Rinnis, I think we did a in 2014, did a 25 year old Ben Rinnis, but no one had really heard the distillery and the uptake on these whiskies was relatively slow, but they're absolutely fantastic. Um, this whiskey in particular, um, Ben Rinnis, is, is made in Speyside, below Ben Rinnis, the Rinnis of Ben. Um, and it's a unique distillery for us because it exclusively uses uh, sherry casks. You can have a look at the colour there. But this is all European oak, um, something that we don't often do at, at Diageo. But this is where that wonderful, rich, chocolatey note is coming in the middle of the blue label. So have a smell of this and then go back and have a smell of the blue label. Wow, it is a, it is a stunning it, chocolatey on the nose. It's, it's yeah, really, and really so really something really kind of jumps out at the blue label now, and it's changed quite a lot from the original, I feel, from the original aromas that you would have got. I know it's been sat there a short while, um, but that's that chocolatey note is definitely, um, is, is definitely all coming from the Ben Rinnis. It's a great whiskey to use in blends when you want to beef things up a little bit. Um, and it it reminds me a lot of the likes of Mortlach and these other big Speyside whiskies that are quite chewy and quite heavy and full on. So have a sip. Um, I'd love to know some some tasting notes from you guys. I know orange came out um, as a tasting note that quite a lot in the in the Klein leash, but I really get that kind of almost Terry's chocolate kind of orange oily zestiness uh, on this one as well. Um, yeah, this is still a, a still a big influence from the European oak. There's still that kind of fresh fruitiness in there, but it's a rich, bold spirit, um, and it's 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 just got all this kind of wonderful chewiness, and isn't I guess typical of what a Speyside whiskey would be. You know, the likes of Glenfiddich, Balvenie, Cardew are all quite you know, they're quite mellow, quite, you know, extremely well-rounded, um, great sipping whiskies, but this is definitely, it's on the chewier side. It's almost, I feel a little bit meaty almost, like it's it's really got something um, quite sulfury behind it as well. Like it's almost like the, the fat off the steak kind of thing, you know, this salty kind of oiliness, but yeah, it's a big, heavy, rich whiskey. And that's where that sweetness from Blue Label is, is really coming in. Mm -hmm. No, certainly we got some great tasting notes there. It feels like big toffee, soft fruits, uh, sweet Christmas spice too. Like says apple, chocolate, treacle. Um, oh, that's great. Very sweet, full flavor. What a great finish. <laughs> and Ben Rennes, 15. It's like eating sweet toffee on a warm spring day in a field of wildflowers. I thought that's an Anfield for a second there. I was like, hang on. <laughs> um, the finish is, is uh, pleasantly dry with a touch of chocolate, digestive biscuits. Brian says ginger, apple juice, sour cherries, blueberries, grape, uh, some grapefruit, light wood, spices and herbs. A hint to smoke, question mark. I presume this is also non-peated, is it? Yeah, not non-peated as well. Um, the only, I guess the, the only interesting thing about Ben Rinnis in terms of... The only interesting thing, Jesus. You're really well, the, the, <laughs> in terms of production um, is that 
like a few other distilleries, but the, um, it ran with one wash still and two spirit stills, and it's got six stills, so they would operate in threes. So up until about 2010, 2012, it was it was using partially triple distilled whiskey as well to go into it, which provides this very light spirit, but they were taking quite a wide, they take quite a wide cut. So there's, there's all that sulfuriness coming through. There's all this kind of richness and as then bunging it into a European um, European cask, it gives it that really chewy meatiness. And that's exactly what Mortlach do as well, it, it, to an extent, you know, 2.81 times distilled um, and then a mixture of bourbon and sherry casks really kind of gives it that, that meaty, meaty texture and very, I guess, unlike, as I said before, unlike Speyside whiskies. Um, but it's always been a good feature of blends and it really helps bulk out the blends in terms of that, that kind of richness, black label, blue label. Um, uh, what's the other one? Crawford's, if anyone can, if anyone's seen a bottle of that in a while, but um, it used to go a lot into the, into that blend as well. So yeah, it's, it's one of those great whiskies that it has a lot to offer and really kind of bulk out a blend, but by itself, I think it's, a, it's almost cognac-esque. In, in a way, it's definitely got that kind of, mm. kind of light floral, rich sweetness that you would expect from a, a, a kind of old eau de vie from, from, a, from a cognac. Um, I, can, I can definitely see that, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't feel embarrassed if I had that just put in front of me, not knowing what it was and almost think it was a, a, a heavily aged cognac. Um, it's definitely got those notes to it. And I, I kind of like the, the idea of someone saying, you know, in the, in the uh, field of flowers and whoever that was I think that kind of hits it on the head it's definitely got a floral note but so chewy yeah well cognac in Cavadas is where the, the 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 money the value for money is in terms of aged spirits and mm. part of the world <laughs> um Phyllis is uh is not a fan he says flavor is shorter than an Ewok um which is you know that's that might be harsh uh initial hint uh, hit of golden syrup uh, then dark chocolate um, David says, put a honey lozenge in your mouth and jump into a swimming pool of chocolate. <laughs> um, Jane says, all become entirely different uh, beasts, tasting and nose close together, uh, tasting and nosing close, and close together. Um, sweet and quite metallic, but in a great way. Uh, the FF collection is all worth uh, exploring, the floral and fauna collection, uh, collection that is. Um, David says, like a tropical Christmas pud. Um, ben says, love the description from Martin and Lorraine, um, which was, let's go back and see that. Oh, it's like the, the sweet toffee in a warm spring day in a field of wildflowers. Yeah, um, that was spot on. Uh, yeah, no, this is absolutely great tasting notes, guys. Keep them, keep them coming in there. Um, uh, Reverend Kevin Wright says, could certainly see this going with ice cream. So there you go. Yeah, I can, I can, I've definitely done things like that before um, and just poured it over. A scoop of vanilla ice cream. It's very nice. Good shout. And Jonathan's got a technical question there. This is are worm tub condensers used at Ben Rinnis? Uh, um, they are, are cast iron. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, cast iron worm tubs. So a lot of, and, and, and ran very cold. So yeah, a lot of that copper contact as well which is going to add to that kind of chewiness um that's a good question i will get back to you yeah have a look. find that out and we'll, we'll let you know i have notes on here somewhere um phil says worm tubs must be the hardest question um definitely i always take my worm tubs fishing um graham says agree with uh, ice cream would go lovely with a magnum classic uh might just try it later Excellent. Um, and Alexis says, what's your favorite food pairing with whiskey? Which is actually quite apt because the some of the, obviously the talk about ice cream and everything it is, this is definitely the well, the first of the three you kind of think, geez, I could have that, um, you know, maybe as, as after dinner sup, sipper or something. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I mean, I don't like the whole after dinner thing. I actually, I, I quite like a, a whiskey before dinner. Um, but I think, again, it's, it's me just trying to Get rid of the stereotypes. I know that everyone, you know, it's that it's that after dinner drink, and I think popular culture has kind of not helped. You know, whenever something bad's happening on a movie or a, a TV series, some some 
gentleman is drinking a, a big scotch in the corner by himself. Like it's it's how it's portrayed. But um, I think my favourite pairing is is kind of like some sort of fresh fish um, fish dish, like starters um, and whiskey highballs, like a whiskey and soda. I think it goes a long way. Glen Elgin and soda. If anyone has any Glen Elgin knocking around the house, that makes the best highball. It's <laughs> it's my my go to. Um, but yeah, Johnny Walker Black and soda um, with a with a decent kind of fish dish, whether it's smoked mackerel pate or something, um, that would be my go to. Especially when the weather's like this. <laughs> well, when you eat like I do, Ali, um, any time of the day could be after dinner. Um, <laughs> Tony says hard cheese, um, which is a good oh, oysters. I'd say this, I could see this going well with oysters. Um, definitely. Uh, it's because that, that kind of chocolatey kind of note, which, which, which you kind of almost get from a good stout, which obviously goes great with oysters as well. Um, whiskey before food, um, uh, enjoying it with no taste pollution. Um, depends on the course. I can certainly see it with dessert. Um, I like it before, during, and after dinner. Um, there you go. No wine on Alex's table. Um, Jonathan this has come to the rescue on the on the warm tub question. He says, Google to the rescue. Uh, answer is yes in the warm tubs. Just thought it was likely <clears throat> with the meatiness. Yeah. So yeah, I know, I know that I know they ran super cold. Um, but yeah, it is worm tubs. I, f I feel like they're cast iron for some reason. Like these great big kind of metal containers outside. But I think um that's obviously going to add to the meatiness of the of the spirit um and i know it's in a very um similar ilk to mortlach and and crag and more which will be our next whiskey as well um marvelous well i suppose we better we best maybe come on to the crag and more the sitters edition um if everyone's ready yeah super I mean, it's up to yourself but yeah no 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 let's let's do it um because there's a, a little bit more I'd like to say about the Legendary Eight as well. So um, the Craig and Moore that we've got is, um, so the, the typical release is a 12 year old. Um, the whiskey in front of you um, is Craig and Moore Distillers Edition, um, which for the, some of you on the call may know a wonderful gentleman by the name of Colin Dunn, who is a, a good friend and a colleague of mine who works in uh, the world of whiskey at Diageo as well, and this is one of his favourites. He absolutely adores this. But it's Crag and Moore, this rich cereal-like spirit. And then for the last three to six months of its life, it's been finished in port pipes. So casts that previously held, port in. You can tell from the colour if you help hold it up to the light. You've definitely got a little bit of of red in there. It's it's got this wonderful kind of like light red hue to it. But this is all this is going to do is add a wonderful amount of fruitiness on the finish um, of what essentially is a whiskey that's very cereal led and very kind of toffee, red apple, honey. Craig and Moore is such a wonderful distillery. It's a real shame we don't talk about it more in, in at Diageo. I think it's an absolutely fantastic distillery. But again, one of these really sought after um, distilleries for blenders because it offers such a great, um, a great spirit. It is, sits in the heart of Speyside. It's a product of placement. It has amazing barley fields around it. It has a water supply and was the first distillery to have a rail, railway station passed straight past it. So produce could come in quickly to the distillery. Casks could leave the distillery relatively quickly. Um, and it, it really kind of sp sped up what Craig and Moore were doing in terms of production. Their, their whiskey was flying out of the distillery down the, down the railway that cuts through Speyside um, and just a, a great a great liquid so have a smell of this one guys I'd love to know your aromas so as you were saying just while people are getting the taste notes in there having a nose of that what you were saying there about uh, people don't talk about uh, Craig and Moore more um, I suppose that's that's the one downside with having as many casks and um, as big a portfolio as Diageo that I suppose some really quality brands can get lost in, in the noise, I imagine. I don't mean that you know, strictly as a negative, but I suppose it's just reality of it. Yeah, I think, I think it's the, the harsh reality of it. And the flora and fauna range, as someone said before, like it's, it's, a, it's a lovely one to go and experience those whiskies. And, and that, that's put together by what the distillery offers, offers best. Um, Manukmore, I don't think a, a distillery I would necessarily go and try or or venture towards if I didn't work for Diageo, but trying it through 
through the floor and fauna range and then seeking it out through independent bottlers i think i think it's one of one of the best whiskies out there um but again we, we don't talk about it we don't do much with it and without the kind of reach that johnny walker has globally i think you know it, it does it does wonders for the scotch industry having these great big blends across the world you know promoting scotch whiskey and and building on that so yeah i mean without blended whiskey I, I know for a fact that single malt certainly certainly wouldn't be where they are today um but i think, think yeah it's it is a shame that we don't get to talk about about some of these great distilleries um but yeah Craig and Moore have, have a, sorry no, I was going to say, did, did, was Craig, did Craig and Moore have a, have a distillery in the um, uh, Game of Thrones range? Uh, no, no, no. I'm going to go with no. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That, that, that was a project that kind of disappeared off, the, uh, off my uh, radar once it was finished. We were so busy with that. Um, that was good. It was a great way to get some whiskies that, um, into other countries that, that weren't there. Uh, Royal Loch Nagar 12 being one we never shipped that to the states and th that was a great way to do it so that was just the same liquid rebottled. um mm -hmm. but yeah let's not delve into Game of Thrones too much please no it was there uh, the, I must say that the that range was better than the last two series I'll tell you that yes. <laughs> um made it made it easier to watch <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's well, that. Uh, port casks always imparts it with smoke, the dram for me, uh, nose biscuity and salty, sweet dry arrival, red berries, cherries, digestive biscuits, uh, crumbled on vanilla ice cream, a little orchard fruit, a hint of sour grapefruit and some peppery spice as the liquid disappears. That last one was Brian's. Um, it was, uh, that is actually, that's a very good tasting note. We must bear that in mind now for, for, for comments of the evening. I could be up there. Um, Alex, I love the barren owl image on the bottles and box artwork. Uh, Martin and Lorraine say nose ripe raspberries soaked overnight in red wine. Uh, Craig and Moore, sneaky, a gentle floral bouquet. Well, Bless you hard owls. upon uh, who's, sipping. Who's got owls on the cat? Who's got owls on the? Um, is, it, well, is, it? is it the Craig and Moore? Well, I'm looking at the bottle here actually, and I can't see any any owls. Um, if someone's pulled up an image, it might be the um, special release, special releases we do. Um, Well, I, I was setting the record straight. Not, 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 not Ali's not letting us away get away with no. <laughs> with a faux pas like that. I'm, I'm worried that we're trying. I'm talking about the wrong whiskey. No, that's fine. Yeah. No, no. The, the, the bottles that they come in anyway don't have the the labeling on them. So I've got you. Yeah, I think someone's googled it and pulled up the special releases. But yeah, the the owl is quite um, quite synonymous with the with the distillery. But yeah, for, um, in terms of production, uh, flat top stills, worm tubs again. Flat top stills are quite unusual, but uh, yeah, it's again got this really nice meaty spirit, which I think has a lot of cereal behind it. It's almost like your break, I can't say breakfast whiskey, but I just have. So it's got that wonderful element of uh, kind of muesli or bran cereal, and then it moves into all that kind of lovely toasted jam at the end. But the port, the port is definitely offering all that fruitiness. We know what these wonderful cast finishes can do to a whiskey. Um, the, there is a little bit of peated malt that still goes into, into Craig and Moore. I think 2% of the, uh, barley of, of that blend is, is peated. So there's still an element of peat, um, going in there. I'm not sure if that's changed recently, but I know for a fact Craig and Moore definitely used to have, um, a small element of peated, peated barley in the, in its blend. Um, and yeah. Tasting notes? Have we got, have we yeah, we got some more. There was, there was, David had one there that was, uh, that, that was fantastic. I've just found there, sneaky, a gentle floral bouquet, smacks you par, uh, hard upon sipping with ripe apples falling straight from the tree right in, in your face. Um, so that was, a, a, was an Isaac Newton kind of moment there. Um, we've got, I'm getting old school cloakroom, um, slightly musty in a nice way with leather satchels. Do you remember the smell after a wet playtime? <laughs> <laughs> um uh, that, no that's a really actually a very good comment um kevin that's 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 spot on um i totally get what you mean there um paul says taste uh chocolate cover raisins nice and oily too uh some fantastic iodine uh manic more out there uh indie um manic yeah. more out there sorry uh, yeah. i read that wrong jonathan's whiskey shop a very nice north star uh manic more at the moment um certainly dead right 
Um, I've I've got, I've gone nostalgic. Um, uh, picking up on food, uh, says Reverend Kevin Wright. Uh, picking up food. Do you know what the the blender's view is on uh, what they eat or don't eat when they're working? Uh, they're not allowed to eat when they're working. Um, I mean, I suppose that is the thing. I mean, people do have quite strict. You know, people they, they, you know they blend. They often taste it quite diluted, don't they? It's it's very strict controlled environment. Ali, if you could um, expand on that. Yeah, I, I mean, they, they've got to look after their palates. Um, None of, none of them smoke, uh, for sure. Spicy food, Jim always used to avoid, um, unfortunately. I, I love spicy food, I feel sorry for him, but he, he always used to avoid that. I think the more you kind of um, test your palate and, and offer it new things, the more experiences you build on, but they do avoid certain things in terms of smoking, very spicy food, um, etc. But everything's done by nose in the blending room. The whiskies are normally diluted to around 24%. And then a lot of it is nosed. Um, there's very little actual tasting going on. And just to put it into perspective, if we're creating a new blend, there will probably be um, the malts blended, the grains, and then a, probably 11 to 15 different iterations of that one blend. And then they'll start boiling it down to which one works best and then go from there to the batching process. So there's a team of uh, 12, 12 blenders now um, headed up by Dr. Emma Walker. Um, but yeah, the, the way that they would do it is, is come up with an idea, start building it and create 11 different variations of the same thing and then go from there and, and work their way down with Emma having the final sign off now. Um, but yeah, you, you'll notice some of the, the kind of um, experimental series we've done with Johnny Walker. You might notice another person's name on the label. Amy Morrison, who, who makes quite a lot, Stuart Morrison, her husband, who also works on the team. Um, but even for the likes of the special releases we do and a lot of the castrant single malts, the blending team will handpick those. They'll work with the distillery managers to handpick those and, and put that collection together. They'll sample casks together, but the tasting only normally happens once they're happy with 10 whiskeys and, and go down from there. Um, so yeah. Not always looking after their palates, um, but it's yeah. I, I I can't begin to imagine the complexities of their job and the way they talk about alcohol. I mean, it's over my head entirely. They're all they're all PhD doctors and you know they're scientists basically. I I feel that I'd just sit in a room and mix stuff together until it tasted all right. But yeah. Well, I was talking to um to to. Uh... Alex Chasco, who's the, the master distiller at uh, Tilling Distillery in Dublin. And he was saying it's, it's you know, obviously it's, 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 it's different, to different strokes, to different folks. But when he was saying that when they're blending a whiskey, they'll try it in a very strict controlled environment, put together what works. But then they'll often take it for a walk around the distillery when they think they're onto something. They'll go down and, and talk to some of the lads in different parts of production and in the even in the, the, the bar and kind of um, other areas, you know, public areas of the distillery and go, what do you reckon? You know, stick it up someone's nose and and kind of get. So I suppose there's different ways to kind of approach it um, and 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 acquire feedback. It's yeah, I mean it, that's it. It's a it's a really good point. And um, when Jim retired last year, um, a lot of the comments from the blenders that I talk to now, they still say they still in the back of their mind when they're creating a blend is what would Jim do? You know, and he's he's got all this experience and he's taught them so much, and it's the way they work together as a team you know you've got 11 completely different palettes so i think what they what they like to do is is sample each other's and go go through there and amy for example who was um who, who's recently had her first child the effects of pregnancy on your perceived taste and everything else you know she was really checking with the guys like i'm not going crazy am i like this is this this is ending up tasting all right you know she she wasn't drinking but she's nosing whiskeys putting them together passing them on to someone else and saying like, am I, am I smelling this wrong or am I, you know? So it's, it's, it's great to have all those people together. And as I said, it's 11 completely different palettes. It's 11 completely different opinions, but so far the formula seems to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, definitely. And, and um, Martin, really have a great question there. I suspect that many people taking part this evening would generally choose a single malt over a blend. I would include myself in that statement. Are we missing out? Should we widen our horizons toward blends? Um, I mean, I'm obviously, I'm obviously going to say yes. I, I, I feel blended whiskey is a great way to get, 
get into the category. It's it's less offensive and not offensive. That's a, that's a terrible word to use. It's less straightforward um, as a, as a single malt would be, um, or aggressive as single as single malt can be. I think with the last whiskey we'll do as well, it gives you a chance to sample two things: whiskies that may no, never be never exist again, and and secondly, the craftsmanship behind it. I think. You know, well, if you sit down and actually think what these guys go through to make a, a brand new blend and then release it to the market, it's it's quite an extraordinary process. And they're taking eight, for the last whiskey, for example, they're taking eight completely deep flavours in the drinking experience. And I, th I think that's something to be um, quite, you know, holding quite high regard. It's uh, it's a real it's a real skill to do this. Um, there's very few people on the planet that actually do it. And uh, I think it's it's amazing, but once you've got your favourite single malt, it's it's hard to kind of deviate from that. And I'm the same. I find myself ordering the same distilleries when I'm when I'm in bars. But if a new blend catches my eye, then yeah, absolutely. Um, and a great example I can give of that is I was in Inverness uh, helping open the new Glenord Distillery Centre uh, Visitor Centre, and I popped into the Malt Room. I think the bar was called in Inverness. And I tried for the first time the Glover whiskey, which is a blend of Japanese uh, whiskey fra and um, Scotch whiskey. And it's just the two distilleries. Um, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, I think it was in at six years old, Japanese whiskey. And um, I forget Adelphi's distillery name now. Uh, um, Ardemore, Ardem I can't remember. Someone will correct me on here, but it was a blend of that whiskey in Japanese and it was absolutely incredible. Arda Merkin, thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, that's it. Uh, it was it was an unbelievable blend, and I think if there's if there's always uh, the chance to take a recommendation from the guys working in these whiskey bars across the UK or across the world, there's there's some great stuff you'll stumble upon. Mm, and there's some great comments backing up what you're saying there, and I would totally agree with people who are saying don't just don't just try blends, try single grains single um or bourbons and you know, like i'm i'm obviously from a large background i'm a big single pot still man so yeah. don't forget don't forget that too yeah I mean, I mean on that as well single grains um the canvas 40 we did for the special releases a few years ago is still one of the best whiskies i've ever tried um but single grain whiskey uh if, if you can find it at a, a decent age statement as well it, it does wonderful things um and there's two of those in here in the next whiskey which we can talk about Marvelous. Well, I suppose that's a good segue to come into the to the um, legendary eight. Um, yeah, sure. It's, I must say, it's. Uh, I mean, since you've got it there as well, it's a, uh, an amazing setup. Like it's. Yeah. If you want to to really, you know, it's made for gifting, I suppose, in that sense. Mm. Um, so still under the still under the blue label uh, banner, we wanted to keep it quite recognisable um, in terms of what we were putting out onto shelves. Um, the box is lovely. You've got these kind of contours coming around, um, representing Scotland, the coastline, um, and then Legendary 8 and the 200th, 200th anniversary. So 1820 is when our, I guess, Johnny Walker journey began. We certainly weren't blending whiskey back then, but um, I guess now once now you've got five drams in front of you and you've had four already, I can, I can start telling a bit of a story. Um, <laughs> I think the, the whole thing began in 1820 and for those of you that don't know the Johnny Walker story John Walker was a he was a real life boy his father passed away um, when he was 14 years old and uh, difficult for uh, any age if, if, when your father passes away but certainly having being that age at that time in, in Scotland in Ayrshire um, you know th there's there's real kind of trouble around that. And I feel you can go down two paths. Um, you either take, you know, you stand up and start being the, the man of the house kind of thing, or you, you know, you fall into maybe um, a different path. Um, at that time, you know, boys that age were normally put to work in the mines or on, in the fields, um, but they were lucky enough to own a farm, which they sold. Um, it was a dairy farm and they sold it for 537 pounds. Um, a modest value which in today's money is is roughly about just shy of fifty thousand pounds i think so they went to kilmarnock and they opened a grocery store 
John would have had help here. I think um, the way we tell this story quite quickly is that he just opened a grocery store at the age of 14. I, that wasn't the case. Uh, he would have had managers. He would have had people there to guide him. We've got an inventory list at our archives of what was actually stocked in the store. And he was selling everything from um, soap to oil, uh, champagne, cognac, and of course, Scotch whiskey. Scotch whiskey in the in the early part of the 19th century was a completely it wasn't a legal product it wasn't a registered product you weren't allowed to make blended Scotch whiskey um, but what John would do is, is blend the whiskey for individuals coming in and he would learn this through being taught by elder people working at the store with him especially around their knowledge of blending tea the tea business was huge in the UK it still is um, and counterfeit teas were coming into the UK more and more. People were bulking out finer teas with, with less quality teas. And this was a way that um, I guess the walkers really based their business from. And we have written um, messages from John and Alexander saying, if we can create a blended whiskey that isn't too expensive, but stands out amongst the rest, then this is a good business model. And this was a correspondence between the two of them and that, that was the idea that was the idea that they wanted to create a whiskey that stood out in terms of flavor nothing on the market should come before it but at a good quality uh, uh, at a reasonable price and sold as a good quality product and that started as i said with red label and black label alexander gifted cases of the whiskey to captains of ships out of glasgow port um, and obviously the railway connecting Glasgow to London, London to the rest of the world, the whiskey expanded and Alexander II, um, Ale Alexander the first son and uh, George Patterson, his nephew, they, they opened the, the kind of gateway to what we know today, the square bottle, the slanted label at 20 degrees. This is the, the one whiskey that you look at a whiskey collection and, and the bottle stands out, you know, it's, it's a clever piece of marketing even for for that time and the striding man is this kind of symbol of progress and it has been going on and on johnny walker was being exported to 100 countries before coca-cola had left the shores of the united states you know it was this really fast growing brand and people wanted johnny walker trips far across the atlantic on ships would have 5,000 cases of johnny walker on them you know this this long journey by ship from the UK over to the US, it was a it was a whiskey party essentially on a boat. You know, Johnny Walker were, was stocking these these uh, extravagant uh, voyages across the Atlantic. The legendary eight. Um, what's in a name? Um, eight distilleries. Eight distilleries that are all over two hundred years old in the Diageo portfolio. The blend consists of Port Dundas, Cambus, Castbridge. You've got then you've got Lagavulin, Blair Athol, um, Oban, and Tiananmen. Oban's an unusual one. Oban doesn't often feature in blends. It's a huge malt uh, in America, and we rarely use it for Johnny Walker blending. Um, also, because the distillery is is relatively small and not producing um, a huge amount of whiskey. So those eight whiskies all offer this wonderful richness. Have a smell of the legendary eight. Have a smell of the blue label, um, and just compare the two quickly. And it'll put into context how light that blue label now smells. That legendary eight is so much sweeter. And that's coming from the Canvas and the Port Dundas in particular, two grain distilleries that closed in the 90s and in the mid 2000s. Um, Port Dundas at one point was the, the largest distillery in Scotland. And Canvas has always been this grain whiskey that blenders had sought after. It was something when it was first being made was a whiskey that everyone wanted to use in their blends. If you get to try Canvas in its raw form as, a, as just a, an aged grain whiskey, it is quite remarkable. Um, but then you get all that rich tropical note in the middle with the Brora, and then you've got the likes of Lagavulin offering all this depth and wonderful smokiness. Tiananmen as well, really kind of backing that up. And Chewy is right, David, that's it. It's so much more chewy than the Blue Label. Um, and you've got, what I really like is all the distilleries listed around the side of the bottle here. So all named, all called out, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. We're also in at 43.8%, which gives it again that little bit more chewiness. It helps the flavors really kind of sing through. Um, and I think I might have missed Blair Athol as well, which is kind of our uh, home of uh, 
a delicious whiskey and, and Bells, the Bells tour you can do through Blair Athol. But Blair Athol, again, one of these wonderful whiskies that has that really kind of rich toffee apple um, uh, note to it. So cheers, guys. This is the last dram of the evening. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this legendary eight, but this is really to celebrate 200 years of, of one young, young man's dream to create a fantastic whiskey. And I think he's, uh, he's done the job quite well. And I always think, would he be proud of the whiskies we're putting out today? Um, I'd like to fucking think so. Because uh, <laughs> I, I, do, I do quite like this one. That's fantastic. And I particularly like David's uh, Chewy comment because it keeps in with the Star Wars theme inspired by was it Phil's Ewok comment earlier on. So. Well, this one's got um, Oban Wan Kenobi in as well, so it's... Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Uh, we've got beautiful, smooth, elegant, classy, evocative of another world, silky, cream, full flavour. Um, Brian says, oily ar arrival, peat mixed with uh, heather honey and caramel. Then comes almonds, peat, coca, vanilla and prunes. Stewed apples and coca as the liquid disappears. Yummy. Uh, Alexis, cinnamon, jackfruit. I actually don't know what a jackfruit is. This is my ignorance. Um, treacle, oily, marzipan with leathery notes holding it together. Uh, Tony C says, real exotic notes, candy, ginger, star anise, wee bit of spice, five spice, but overlaid with dark, uh, chocolatey, slightly bitter, but sweetness, yum. Paul is a great comment. Wow, clotted cream. I totally get what you mean there. Uh, my God, that's good. Uh, says Ben, that's really good. We might have a new leader here. Absolutely, says Phil. Oily, pineapple, um, chewy fruits. Um, there are some of the standout ones. There's a, what a wonderful finish uh, on the L8. Smokiness comes to the fore, but it doesn't overpower a fruitiness. There's also a touch of vanilla in there. It is really, really well balanced. Um, we've got inviting rich toffee on the nose, full creamy with a touch of citrus and a hint of Scottish table or on the, on the palate. Uh, what a lovely dram. Yeah. It's great. I, I hope um, the the the, two, the three I want to point out in that blend is is the canvas at the start where someone's talking about um, clotted cream and that almost um, creme brulee note to it. But then as it moves through, we get the the tropical notes from Brora. But I, is everyone still picking up the smokiness? It would have been different to the blue label because the smoke from this one is a sweeter smoke. It's coming from Lagavulin as opposed to Kalila, which is a more medicinal, oily smoke. So um, I hope you guys are still getting that smokiness, but Lagavulin, as we know, is a much bigger whiskey. So um, I, I hope you're kind of getting that kind of richer smoke coming through at the end. Um, yeah, super complex, and I think almost akin to the um, Klein Leash. It's, there's so much going on. It's, it's one to really sit down and, and try and dissect yourself. But eight whiskies all over 200 years. And the reason for that is that these whiskies would have been used by the walkers to, to make whiskey, you know, a uh, hundred, a hundred plus years ago. <clears throat> no, this is certainly marvelous. Um, no, I, I, I must say I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, so we'll see the, I'm sure like a lot of us here, that's the first time I've ever tried that. Um, and it certainly has lived up to expectations. Uh, James also, also agrees. It's a lovely dram, uh, like a desert of fruitiness with creamy aftertaste um, or dessert of fruitiness with creamy aftertaste. You can taste the lag side of this. Um, complex is the word, but by God, it works beautiful. Uh, just going back to the blue, lots of custard. It's amazing how how light and fruity and sweet the blue is in comparison now. It's, it's, it's great. I, th I feel for, for anyone, to, as I said before, it's such a neat trick to do. Um, and we've done it before even with uh hey club or you know something as, as light and as easy going as that but the way it changes and it's a really nice um kind of palette reset to go back to your first whiskey that you've had in 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 the lineup and see how it changes but yeah i hope you've enjoyed that kind of little bit of it um and thank you very much uh luke is there uh any more questions on the legendary eight coming in yeah, um, not so much in the directly in the legendary eight, but um, there's a couple other questions coming in that we might come to in a second. I suppose now, before we all get too pissed, would be a good time to um, to get your opinion on what the best question and tasting note was. Um, if you're not, well, what I, I have a few ideas, but I thought I'd like to get your idea and what jumped out at you. Um, oh, this is pre this is pressure now. Um, pressure makes diamonds, Ali. 
Yeah, but it's true. I, th- I, you know what? I did like the, I love the Ben Rinnis one, but there was another one. There was Ben Rinnis in the in the in the field with the flowers, but it was just the two tasting notes. Um, but I do like that because I, I find it quite cognac-y. Someone did a really good Glen uh sorry, Climbish one, as well. But I can't remember. I've got I've got over a hundred comments in this thing, so I, yeah. I like the sip. Um... I did like that one. I, I know the one you mean. Um, if that was you, drop me a, a DM and I'll verify um, after tasting. I can read back over the chat when the recording finishes. Um, there was also, um, so I'll know also if you messaged me saying, oh, that was me. I'll know if you're lying. <laughs> I also did like um, the Reverend Kevin White's one about um, uh, playing playing wet. Um, so I'm, I think, you know, we do have an extra skew. So we might be two winners. Um, so yeah, those are two good. What about question wise? Was there any question you were asked tonight that you thought was uh, was particularly good? Um, Don't pick the worm tub one because <laughs> you'll encourage bad behavior amongst the. Uh... <laughs> no, I mean it was, it was a good it was a good question. And, uh, it was a good question, but if they if they win the bottle, everyone will be asking these really awkward technical questions yeah, to every, no. everyone. Because <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm being facetious, obviously. Um, I think just to open it up and you know. The, um, everything else. What what I would drink outside of the Diageo range? I think that's a it's a nice question to ask people, and I think people avoid asking it at tasting sometimes um, because they think, oh, it's it's this one one person representing this brand. Is it rude to ask it? But it, it never is, and I think it's always a nice question, and it sparks a bit more conversation. So I, I would say that is uh, is always a good one to get. Marvelous. Well, that's perfect. So we'll go with the with the the three of those. If you could. Private message me, folks, uh, an email address because not everyone's name on here. That was um, Alex Gardner with the non Diageo brand question. I think. Yeah, I think that sounds right, Alex. If you could DM me your 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 email, just because. Uh, yeah, just want to make sure that <laughs> not everyone's name on the the obviously the the Zoom matches their their name when they buy the pack. When I look over my list of of details and stuff. So anyone whose whose question you think was mentioned uh, was mentioned there, just drop me a, a, a private message. And I'll, I'll get back to you tomorrow um, via the email and I'll have a look online and see a picture's posted. And then I might, because I'm going to have to yeah. rewatch this um, before we... There was upload. One we did, there was... Yeah, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, there was another... Um, someone, I think, earlier was asking price of Klein Leash. I think, I think it's... I, I mean, I, I think about four, 45 to 46. 48 wow. we're, we're setting the Klein Leash for. Sorry, mate. Um, <laughs> well, 48. <laughs> There will be a discount. I actually don't have the discount code active today. I'm just actually back from holidays on the personal, which is why I'm a bit not organized today. Um, but when I email out the uh, the recording, I'll have the discount code for the, for these whiskies as well, along with links to each one, so um, you can all partake. And I have an extra skew as well. I was going to say of these bottles to give away, so I'll, I'll be watching back over this before um, for you know before I, I upload the recording. So um, if there's anything that jumps out, I'll I'll we'll throw in an extra bottle for someone um as well so there'll be five bottles going to tea tonight folks so um what more can you can you ask for um there was um alex had asked as well what's the favorite ever diageo dram that you've tried and why um ooh. i don't know i don't have like a i don't have a list of top like they're not in order so it's i have a top five um three of which are diageo whiskies but it's been it's been the occasion I've been drinking it um, and and where I was and what I was doing kind of thing and who I was with. Um, at my best friend's wedding, we we both had a um, Grora 34 year old, um, which was which was incredible. Um, the uh, the Inch Gower 27 year old from the special releases we did a while ago was it was one of the most complex whiskies I've ever tried and I think that's an absolute banger but the Canvas 40 the single grain as well is is right up there that's in a new I mean that shouldn't even be in a top five list it's in another echelon it's in, in another world that whiskey I just I can't get over it um, there was one bottle left in the at Johnny Walker Princess Street which I had my eye on but it's kind of uh, out out of my price range a little bit, so it's now gone. So, my my bad for missing the boat. I think, um, but yeah, 
definitely, definitely those three. Inchgower 27, which I think you can still find. The other one, which is super interesting, and just quickly talking about blends, is uh, this, which I think you can still find online. Um, this is the Collectivum 28. It's a 57.3 cast strength blend of all 28 of our single malt distilleries. And I, I don't know how, how someone's tasked the blenders with doing that, but it's an absolutely incredible blend. It's about 140, 150 pounds a bottle, but worth every penny. And that is one of the best blends I've ever tried. So that would be, th those are my four. Done. Marvellous. No, that's, that's, that's a great answer. Um, brilliant. Um, we've got some other great, some very kind comments on, on, on the tasting. So thank you, folks. Um, um, Melvin actually says, if I give you a hundred pounds uh, and said, buy me the best bottle, what would it be? The question B would actually would be, would you come back at all at all? But assuming you did, um, what, what would you come back with? With a hundred quid? With a hundred quid, yeah. Um, Kalila 18. I think it's it's smoky bacon crisps and it's just a great rounded um, Isla whiskey. Kalila 18, I think is, uh, I think are up there around 100 quid. I think that'd be change for you as well. Um, but yeah, definitely that one. Excellent. Uh, and Oliver, because this is a big, obviously in, um, in the Diageo family, this is a big thing. So what's your go-to whiskey region? Oh, uh, well, Highlands, I guess. If I could, if I could have have a, a a pick of all of them, um, Klein Leash and Brora up there. But Hi Highlands, Highland whiskies. I think if you can take the journey up there and visit distilleries, I think it's the place as well. I, lo I love visiting the Highlands. Um, so yeah, Highlands. And, um, and the, the follow up question on that on that front, because you said Highlands. Um, as a Diageo employee, does the Highlands include the islands? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I don't no, I can't say that. That's cheating. Um, <laughs> I would love it to, but no, I'll leave. Uh, I'll leave Talisco and Isla and Orkney to them to themselves. Um, but yeah, marvelous. No, that, that's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've had a fantastic night, uh, Ali. So thanks for thanks for joining us. I really hope everyone else has. I'll be in touch, um, folks, with a discount code. I'll be in touch with the competition winners, and uh, we'll have the the recording out to you as well. So I really hope you've enjoyed tonight um and if there's anything we missed or didn't get to please do drop me an email and I, i'll if it's if it's something Ali can can help but i'll forward it on to him and we'll, we'll get you sorted um so thanks very much we hope to see you again we've got our next tasting is a bushmills tasting um in two weeks time on the 28th the there is actually literally only four packs of that left so if you haven't already if you enjoyed tonight and you haven't already purchased one i'd get on straight away and buy it because of feeling before the weekend I think I might get one. I love Bushmills. <laughs> do, do, definitely, no, genuinely, do. It's, it's, a, it's a really impressive lineup. There's also there's the 1991 Causeway collection on there, um, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a 700 pound bottle of whiskey. So um, it's worth, you know, might, might give that legendary eight a, a run for its money. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with the Irish. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, Diageo used to own Bushmills. So there's did. always that. <laughs> we, we, sold, we sold it to buy a tequila, uh, which we can't get in the, into the country. So, and yeah. you sold it to to a tequila, or we sold company, it, Jose no, Curvo. We, I know we sold it on to to um, venture into Don Julio and and tequila. But yeah, I miss I miss Bushmills. It's a, it was a great brand. I thought uh, um, it's it's still there. <laughs> I miss it. I, mean, I wish it was part of our portfolio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, thank you very much, guys. Luke, thanks very much. Um, let me know who the winners are as well. We'll do. We'll do. Yeah. Thank you so much, mate. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, and we'll uh we'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.